wait for that to start. And I will let people know that this will be shared on YouTube and it'll also be on my podcast on Spreaker and on the website, Mindful Social Marketing. So we're gonna see Ted everywhere, like we always do. It's not okay. news. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's my fault. I apologize to all you people for uh, syndicating as much as I do, but just trying to you know reach as many people and engage with as many people as I can. That's all good stuff. And that's the point of R&R, &R, right? That's right. Yeah. So Ted, for the very tiny amount of people who don't know who you are, why don't you give us a, a quick bio? Well, you know, it, it, I'm 58 years old, so you, you want a quick bio. You certainly don't want the whole thing. So, you know, I, I've been around business and um, the investment community and media for most of my career, but just to, to run it up into more current times, um, I was fortunate to um, connect with and work for Seth Godin in, in 1997 to 19, the end of 1998. And that's back when he had his first startup uh, called Yo-Yo Dine, which was before he had written any of his bestsellers. And I, I you know, it's, it's just been a very a fortunate happenstance. I, I hooked up with a guy that really, you know, as much as it's hard to tell with him one-on-one -on -one because of the way he puts off connection is that he really believes in connection between companies. He coined the term permission marketing when I was at Yo-Yo Dine. He, it was originally a, um, an article for Fast Company that became his first bestseller and was really, for him, was kind of the hub and start of all of it, very similar to like my return and relationship. And a lot of my thoughts about that started there. So I was around you know, at the beginning of, of, of this new digital world when when e-commerce e was simply a catalog online and, and uh, media was just taking magazines and basically printing the pages or putting them into websites. Mm -hmm. So I've seen a real evolution. I was fortunate to be at Yo-Yo Dine. We were acquired, we were one of the early companies to get acquired by Yahoo. So I had an opportunity to work with a company that was the, the company of the time, the way Google's become, the way Facebook's become, you know, at one time or another. And I, I moved through that era. I went to a, a game maker that got in, an investment for electronic arts. I went to uh, 800 Flowers for a little while and helped run their corporate and business development and then ended up back in the whole lead gen um, and advertising and media world. I, I ran something called the Black Book, turned it around for a company that bought it right before bankruptcy. And this was a traditional company that made printed um, pages in a, in a really high level um, publication of photographers and illustrators work. And then I found my way to a company called Elf Cosmetics, which is really where I jumped into the social world back in 2008, before everybody else was really in it in, in the commerce world. I was very lucky because uh, I'm not sure that I would have had the same opportunity today that I did with Elf then when people were basically afraid of social. And I had a family owned business with no legal department, with nobody telling me what I could, couldn't, couldn't do. And I really got a chance to experiment to an incredibly vast degree, uh, more than I would have been able to at, at a larger company at the time. And it, it just gave me a jump start into all of how this stuff works, what's important about engagement, how you connect with people. And early on, uh, the people that I first got involved with um, social from, uh, a guy named Oz Sultan, some of you people might know him. Oz is the mm -hmm. guy that first got me on Twitter with a guy named Roger Hollander. You know, both of them came from the school of, this is a way to connect with people, not necessarily um, a way for the, to, to just market. Now, I believe right. there's a great marketing right. potential in social, but basically what it was is that this is a place to market rather than to advertise. Mm -hmm. And for me, marketing is more about building relationships, about building loyalty and trust. So I was very fortunate. I did that. And then I kind of moved through a great progression. I joined a company called Open Sky that was involved in the early days of social commerce. Uh, and then I moved to a company called Collective Bias, where I became a shareholder, uh, where we were building content at scale for brands, uh, user generated with an emotional connection. Um, so I really got a, an early start back in 2010 with John Andrews and that whole area and the whole blogging community. And, and, you know, now I, I left Collective Bias in 2013. I speak, I work with major brands, I work with startups. I'm lucky to be able to do a lot of different things. And uh, it's what brought me to meet, every week I meet new people. I travel all the time. Um, I'm at about 50 plus events a year uh, that I'm either speaking at or hosting. And I get to connect face to face with people like you, Janet. I mean, that's how we met, right? If, if I remember correctly, I mean, we knew each other socially. But if I remember correctly, I, I, you came to the SDL event. Is that when we met the first time? Yeah, that's the first time yeah, we met. That's the first time we met face to face, um, right? Um, that was before all this great lab and Periscope <laughs> and the ability to kind of do this kind of thing or Snapchat. I mean, I, 
I'm loving Snapchat because, I mean, talk about empathy. You really get to relate to people. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. somebody connects with you, you can send them a quick video message of, of, of thank you. That really is much more personalized. Now, you know, it, it is harder to scale, but then again, it's like I like to say, a brand is what you do. A, bit, a, a reputation is what people remember and share. So it really scales a lot more than people realize because it's not just the one person you're interacting with. It's all the others that see, hear, feel, hear about you, know that you're willing to connect and those kind of things. So that was That's a one, long-winded reply to your question. <laughs> That's one of the things I love about this platform is that we get to see those reactions in real time. You know, what we can see going on in the chat and, and you guys, if you have any questions, just type slash Q and and post a question for Ted or me. And it's really, you know, it's a wonderful interface because we get to have more personal connection with that video back and forth than we do. Quick shout out to Rebecca Blackmore from, quick shout out to Rebecca Blackmore from the UK. Becky, I will (laughs) be back in the UK. When was the last time you were there? I believe it was November, right, Becky? Yeah, and, Mm -hmm. and I saw Becky, there was a Brand Innovators event there. I also saw Becky, when I spoke at a um, Terrapin event in September in London. So uh, I have not been to Italy yet. No, and I want to find somebody to bring me there to speak. I love Italy. I haven't been there since the Black Book when I used to do my printing um, over there. And I would love to be back. So Mm. thank you for coming. Thanks for joining us. I'm excited to talk about our topic. Um, Yeah, uh, so let's let's dive into that. I was saying before you got on that I just got the first copy of Mindful Social Marketing in print. Oh, nice. And we have the same publisher, Substantium, that uh, you used to publish your last book, too. And I I want to tell people. I'm sorry. And my next one. And the next one. Oh, there's a new one coming out. Hopefully before the end of this year. Are you going to leak what that's about yet or not? It's called Selling in the Age of Influence. Cool. I'm sure well, I'll look forward to that. That'll be very interesting. Yeah. Uh, Ted was really instrumental in the third chapter of the book, which is really about employee engagement. And he was kind enough to, to give me a, some really great copy there. And then I read a blog post that you wrote on your blog about empathy. And, you know, that really hits home to a lot of the concepts around mindful social marketing and really being mindful of of others when you're using social, whether it's for personal or it's for business. And, you know, you were just saying that you had kind of a an encounter with customer service and empathy. So why don't we kind of start there? Well, you know, I think it's a good place to start because I, I want to make a point that, you know, very often we look at empathy from one direction and not from both directions. So here it was, uh, I travel a lot. I'm not I'm not home very much. I also have a place in Florida that this time of year, I try to spend more time in than here when I'm down. And recently, right before I left, I was doing some laundry and I went to put stuff on the dryer and the dryer wouldn't work. Mm-hmm. And the dryer's 18 months old. You know, long story short, I did buy an extended service contract, never buy them with TVs, always buy them with uh, kitchen appliances. And um, I, I, but it was very hard to make an appointment. I'm home one day. When I'm, when I'm going to be around tomorrow, I'm in New York city, Friday, I leave for Dublin. So I was able to make an appointment and I picked a window that would work around the doctor's appointment I had this morning and this chat we're having today. And the guy ends up coming early and I wasn't even home yet when he came, I was still at my doctor's appointment and he tells me, listen, he can only wait about 10 minutes and you know, and then he's going to have to go somewhere else. And I'm like, well, can you come back later in the day? And he says, no. And then I said, well, my appointment was later in the day. He goes, I know, but things got juggled. And what you immediately have to realize is you can't always count on people to have empathy for you. You have to create that empathy. And this is the point I want to make is that you need to now communicate with them in such a way that you can allow them to have that empathy back for you. And what happens with too many people is they get annoyed. I mean, I easily could have gotten angry and said, hey, listen. You know, I called two weeks in advance. My appointment was between two and six. You're showing up at 12. And now you're telling me you can't wait 20 minutes for me to get home. I am on my way home. Now, if I had done that, I would have gotten the guys back up. And I wouldn't Mm -hmm. have given him the opportunity to have empathy for me. I would have immediately clicked into his defense mechanism. 
But instead, what, you know, look, and don't get me wrong. This has taken me years to learn. This isn't something I could do when I was in my 20s. You know, and I did have people trying to teach it to me. I had mentors that always told me you get more with, you know, with honey than with vinegar. But it took me maybe fighting for my kids and all the things I've been through and, and the situations where they were absolutely no wins to learn how to create that in someone else. So, I mean, I do this when I'm flying. I do this when I'm in stores. Again, instead of jumping on the attack, I'm like, hey, you know, what's your name? He tells me his name's Yuri. I said, Yuri, listen, you know, I travel a lot. I'm a divorced dad. I'm rarely home. I said, and this is like my only opportunity to have you come fix this thing. And I'm, I was at a doctor's appointment, you know, and then I pause for a minute. He doesn't know what the doctor's appointment's for. Let him think whatever. And then I said, isn't there any way you can work with me here? You know, why don't you go out to lunch and I'll buy you lunch? You know, whatever mm -hmm. it takes. And immediately like, I could feel the change. And he's like, well, the appointment's this one and it's supposed to be hard. Let me make a call. Meanwhile, he waits for me. And, and now it turns out that my dryer's shot, that it's only 18 months old and it's all rotted out. Like, you know, and something was installed improperly. He's telling me why is there, he's asking me why there's moisture on the inside. I'm like, dude, like... <laughs> I'm a social media guy. I don't know about mm. this stuff. But in the end, if I hadn't had him do this, because now he's got to put in an application to the insurance company to try to get it covered. You know, I'm not really worried about it because between Home Depot and Whirlpool, an 18-month-old $900 dryer, I'm sure somebody's going to take care of. But the point is, is that you can enable, empower, um, spark empathy for you and your situation or a situation that's important to you from others if you approach it correctly. And I just thought that was a, a great way to start this out because a lot mm. of it look at just as us being empathetic to others. But there's also ways to, and by the way, I, I wasn't playing the guy. This was, is really a hassle for me. I'm home for a day and a half half the time. I got to get my laundry done. You know, I don't have anybody home to take care of this while I'm gone. But I, I was able to express that in a way that made him want to support me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that really, that says a huge amount about how you really do practice mindfulness in your day to day life too. That, you know, it's like, okay, I could be a total jerk here and I could go off and he would not do anything that you wanted him to do. And really just taking that moment to take a breath and go, okay, if I want to get this resolved, I just have to be nice. I have right, to. But I need it. And even go a step further with the mindfulness to say, how do I put him in my shoes? How do I put him in a place that he, now this happens everywhere. This happens when you're on a plane. I mean, my first reaction when I, I you guys might remember, but about a week or two, maybe three ago, two flight attendants had a fight on board a plane and the pilot had to make an emergency landing in an airport <laughs> they weren't supposed to go to because the yeah, flight man. attendant. And of course, all most of the comments on this post were outraged. How dare them? I can't believe they did this. My initial reaction, it really was because my whole mindset has changed. My initial reaction is, oh my God, what must have been done to these two women to cause this to happen? Like what stress must they have been under? What must have been happening on that flight that created that 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 angst in them that caused them to, to, to have this kind of a thing, you know, mm -hmm. and not be able to set it aside until they landed. And I think that you know, you, you have to be able to put yourself off, whether you're a boss, whether you're, you're, you're training somebody, whether it's somebody new in your company, and be able to put yourself there, whether it's to help them along or it's to help you alone. There's nothing wrong with helping yourself. You know, that doesn't take away the value of empathy, creating empathy for you as long as it's justified. I mean, mm -hmm. again, fake empathy, getting something that you don't deserve, that's a different kind of a thing. But when it's something for you, whether you're traveling, I mean, look, how many of us travel I, the other day? Okay. When I, yesterday, when I was traveling, uh, flights were being canceled into New York and people were freaking out. And my, and I looked and said, you know what? I'm lucky. This is one of those flights. I don't have to be there. I can get home late. I can get home tomorrow. So I'm just going to take a breath and relax and not, you know, let this get me bent out of shape. And I'm going to save that favor. Like, I'm not going to go and say, oh, my God, you have to get me on this plane. Can you switch me? And, you know, I reach out to social teams. I reach out to people I know. And can you switch my flight? I'm not going to do that when it's not necessary. And that's also something that you create as part of your reputation. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely true. And, and it's also, you know, having a little empathy for yourself. I mean, if you make a mistake or maybe you're just having a really crappy day, you know, you got to just kind of recognize that in yourself and go, OK. You know, I'm just going to sit down here. I'm going to chill out. There's nothing I can do about this. And instead of winding yourself all up, you can do something for yourself and just go, okay, I'm going to chill. 
Uh, no doubt. And that's, I'm really glad you brought up that point. Cause I was talking about that a little bit on the beach the other day. I, I had some snaps that I downloaded that I'm going to post. I mean, they were more about, you know, this whole thing about that. It's what you think about Dale Carnegie likes to say, in essence, I'm paraphrasing. It's not what you have, what you do, where you are that makes you happy. It's what you think about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's a great thing to say. And I tell people a lot about that. It's attitude, perspective, and mindset. But what about those times when you have to think about something that sucks? You know, mm -hmm. you know, right? I mean, whether it's a change in career, whether it's you're not making enough money, whether you're doing something wrong, whether there's something with your kids. I mean, all, all the whole plethora of things that could be going on. How do you keep that? How do you keep that out and make yourself feel good? Well, I, you know, I was talking a little bit about compartmentalizing. And I think what you just brought up is a very important part of that. It's giving yourself a break. It, and and a, I mean a break in two ways a break in a break where you take a little time off and giving yourself a break is the expression where like hey we're not perfect I mean you know I, I I am my own worst critic and I think most of us are you know I give myself an incredibly hard time I'm annoyed with myself right now over things that I wanted to get done that I haven't gotten done or more I wanted to do or more I wanted to accomplish I mean first we're getting into the third month of the the last month of the first quarter and there are some more things I that I had planned on getting done now. And I've, the last week or so, I've been beating myself up to the point where I wake up unhappy every morning. I wake up stressed every morning. And I just, I did exactly what you said. I said to myself the two days ago in Florida, I said, dude, give yourself a break. Just put it all on the back burner for a couple of days, you know, and breathe because you would that, first of all, a lot of that stuff comes to you. You know, I've learned that very often when you take that step back, you find the answers. You know, for me, sometimes it's something as simple as putting everything down and taking a nap for 10 minutes, you know, and then it allows my mind to just free up a little bit. And I wake up with the answer and I think like, how did that happen? It happened because you're actually working it out in your head. Mm -hmm. You just stopped with the giving yourself such a hard time. So I think being mindful of being empathetic to ourselves is a, is a really you know, great topic. And look, mindfulness goes in so many different ways. It, it, it's about people around us. It's about reactions. I mean, now you look at the political scene, you know, a little bit crazy, right? You, you can it's see- getting really reactive. reactive. Very reactive. And you can see a lot of hatred in a lot of different sides. And then you can see a lot of people who, you know, put out questions like, well, how could, how could you possibly vote for this person? But mm -hmm. truth be told, and I'm not saying I agree with some of these the things that are being said, but the truth is, if you take a step back and you think about where this person is in life, who this person is, what they've been dealing with, and then you go back and look at the message that they're hearing, whether you believe in it or not, whether you think it's true or not, whether you think that person's lying or making it up, whatever, just go back to what they're hearing. You can say, hey, I, I can get why this is happening. Yeah. And it can be as simple as the environment in the country or the fact that entertainment has become a big part of our politics. And, and I, you might hear me saying that a little bit with disdain. But it, again, that's my opinion, but that's not the way somebody else is viewing it. And that's a really good point, too, is that, you know, especially these kind of things where it's really polarized and we all have very strong opinions, then it's even more important to step back and kind of not carry that anger through to our conversations online with others, if they don't have the same beliefs that we have, they're entitled to that. I may not agree with them. I may think they're crazy, but I'm not going to, you know, be combative about that online. It doesn't do anybody any good. And it also is taken totally out of context nine times out of 10. So people are going to see you as a really angry person when that isn't your normal state of being. Yes. And, you know, um, a great point was just made about um, Adam. Adam's point about that we, we can be very empathetic with others, but very often, very often the people that are most empathetic with others are hardest on themselves. And a lot of that comes from that level of being able to be mindful of other people. It takes a lot out of us. I mean, mm -hmm. it does. So very often you don't have you don't have that left for yourself or, you know, again. And then another part of it is is looking back in criticism on yourself instead of on evaluation of yourself. Oh, you know, big you, difference. Right. Because looking back on evaluation says, what did I do? How did I handle it? How could I handle it better? What have I learned from it? Looking back at it in criticism. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can look back on almost anything I did and find a better way to do it. <laughs> right, I mean, you know, all the time. To some degree, I mean, and and to the point where when I first, I mean, I'm sure we all go through this, but when I first started speaking, and, and I still have it now, I just don't let the voice bother me. Is I'd always have this voice saying, "You suck," 
Like, because mm-hmm. you, you don't realize when you speak is that you know everything you forgot to say. You know everything you didn't say as well as you could, but the audience doesn't. And I would walk off stage every time being so incredibly hard on myself and people would be standing up clapping. And I'd be like, seriously? Like, I didn't say this. I didn't say this. I left this out. And then it was like the old Seinfeld episode where George gets insulted at the table and he doesn't come back with the good comeback until two hours after the meeting's over. And he's like, I want to get back in there because I've got my good comeback. You know, and somebody <laughs> asks you a question when you're on stage or you're being interviewed. And two hours later, you realize the better answer. I can't tell you how many times I've said, excuse me, can I come back up there? I've got a better answer to what I, what I just said. But then again, that goes to mindfulness of the fact that we're in the moment and we do things in the moment that we can't always do to, to the best of our ability. We're going to do it the best we can then, and then we're going to evaluate and try to do better later or not. I mean, some people don't want to improve, and that's okay too. Well, and it's almost impossible to say everything that you could possibly say on a tough, on a subject when you're on stage in the first place. So, you know, and and – there's been a lot of discussion lately about imposter syndrome and how you get up on stage and you're like, wow, do I even deserve to be here? And that's such a difficult self-criticism. But I I know that almost everybody suffers from that criticism at some point and being a little empathic to ourselves and going, OK, all these people came. They're here. There must be some value in what I have to say. And if there's not too bad. <laughs> there you go. There's value for me. <laughs> and there's the mindfulness towards myself. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, one of the things that I thought was really interesting about the post that you wrote was you were talking about how difficult it was when you were in middle school and you were just moving into town and you were the new kid and, and you were under so much stress in the first place. And so there's a lot of that kind of interaction going on in our day-to-day lives, especially now with social media, because we run into people all the time that, you know, we're making new introductions to, we're putting our face out there, um, our comments out there, and then kind of hoping that, you know, everything goes okay. So can we talk a little bit about how we could be having empathy towards other people through social? Well, Look, I think it's like everything else we do is that you have to remember that there's two things happening here. First of all, it's incredibly visible. Um, There are usually many more people watching than you know, because it's usually way more than the the likes or the clicks or the comments. And then you have to realize that we're under a microscope because we're giving everybody the, the ability to go back in time and review everything we said. I mean, if I'm up on stage... Even if it's being recorded, that's for somebody's use later. It's really hard for someone to go back and say, hey, you know, at the beginning of your talk, you said, you know, and, and, and actually remember that. Whereas now, when we're done here, people can go back and analyze this entire conversation you and I are having and, and tell me that I stuttered twice or that I changed my opinion or, and I have to live with that. So mm-hmm. what really people have to realize, and I'm, I'm, I want to say this in the positive sense, not the scary sense is that everything we're doing lives on and it's analyzable. Now, too many people, I think, make a big deal on the, oh my God, you know, you're giving away way too much information. People know where you live. They know what you're saying. They can go back and you can get in trouble and you might not get into a college and you might not get your job. And truth be told, I don't believe that. Most people Mm -hmm. are not going that deep. But what it is, is being mindful that what you're saying is going on record. And there's a good part of that also. I mean, I'm mindful of the fact that when I write something down, it's saving it for the future for me. I can go back and review that. I don't have to necessarily have it in my blog so that I can find it. I can now, now you're capable of searching more and more on Facebook, on Twitter and finding things you talked about and comments you made and, and even reviewing yourself. How have my perspectives and opinions evolved? over the course of time. And when we all change our opinions, I mean, I love when somebody calls me out and says, three years ago, you said, you know, this wasn't gonna work. I'm like, well, I was wrong. And that was three years ago. Why are you doing it now? Because now it's not only working, but it's a place I have to be. I mean, sure, I jumped on Snapchat in the beginning. I was one of the first guys on Snapchat with a couple of my buddies. And, you know, we had a lot of fun sending each other pictures in the bathroom and, you know, pictures from the hotel rooms. And it ended after about a week because it was silly and it was a waste of our time. Um, and we didn't and we didn't really understand it. And over time, not only did we come to understand it more, but also the platform evolved. I mean, mm-hmm. let's look at yeah, I was just reading a great article today about Airbnb. And most people don't the most anybody who in this audience knows where the air came from. 
Air was air mattresses. Did you know that? No, really? Airbnb wow. That's was Airbnb was originally called Air Bed and Breakfast, and it was because the three founders put six air mattresses in their apartment while they were living there <laughs> and, and rented out the space and made breakfast for people coming in for an event. That is the – and by the way, that was the beginning of the business. It's, it's why – it's why um, a, a, a certain big investors didn't invest in it because they couldn't get past the air mattress part of it. And, and eventually, they, and I, I never, I thought it was because you can rent something through the air. I mean, it's what most people think. You know, but, but again, it's, it's talking about just the way things evolve and the way things change. And that business wasn't what it, it isn't today what it is now. And then also they, they, they changed it a whole bunch of different times. So, you know, it's about figuring out how you can best connect with people. But now everything lives. And even with Snapchat, I mean, remember, it doesn't all disappear because people like me are, are, and other people are downloading your content. I'm downloading my own content. I mean, what I love about mm -hmm. Snapchat, it's a great platform for me to tell stories on and then download that content. And I'm syndicating it to a whole bunch of different places. And I'm having a lot of fun with it that way. And I'm also making double and triple and quadruple use out of something I'm doing in one place. So that content is living on. And, yeah. and and by the way, one of the benefits of Snapchat, if you talk to some of the early adopters in the corporate world, like Grubhub um, and, and Groupon, is that content from Snapchat is shared very, very actively on other platforms. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, it's being mindful of the fact that your content is around, that what you're saying exists, that let's look at it from the perspective of if you're hurtful to somebody, that hurt can stay around for a long time. So I, I think that we just have to, we have to do what I call looking people in the eye digitally. We have to know them as people. It's not just Jay Fouts or Janet Fouts, at Janet Fouts. It's Janet Fouts. Fouts has a photo. And by the way, in reverse, you have to give people that opportunity. You don't have a logo, in, in, unless you're a corporation, obviously. But if you're a person, you know, I see some people with logos that are individuals. Put your face up there. And if you can't, for some reason, on your on your profile shot, put it easy, easy to find. I mean, I find people on LinkedIn sometimes don't have photos. And all that does is depersonalize instead of personalizing. I'm not seeing a person. I'm seeing a logo. And the benefit, by the way, remember, everyone talks about, oh, companies, you have to put up a person's face so we feel good. But it's also about you being able to relate to that person. So I just mm -hmm. think that, you know, call people by name. A lot of us don't do that. I say this every day. Watch me on social media, and I will promise you that the vast majority of the time, probably over 90%, when I reply to people, I reply to them by name. You know, granted, sometimes there's not enough room in a tweet, or, you know, I'm running, I'm busy, and I'm giving a thumbs up or a smile or something, but I'm doing more than simply retweeting. I'm putting in a message, and whenever I can, I call them by name because there's no sound in any language that's more beautiful to anybody's ear than the sound of their own name. And by the way, please don't quote me because Ted Rubin didn't make that up. That was written in 1936 by Dale Carnegie in How mm. to Win Friends and Influence People. And this is when maybe you met 100 people in your entire life. Now you're meeting thousands. But when you call them by name, when you take that effort, even when I write, um, <laughs> okay, Frisbee guy, put your goddamn picture up there, okay? Even when um, <laughs> not some cartoon of you with Frisbees, um, but, you know, <laughs> Uh, they're now in real. Even an email. It's so easy for us to get caught up in a quick reply. No, I can't do it. Thank you very much. But I try to add, so I, I, and I tell you, I find myself stepping back. I'm about to click send, and I add in Janet. I'll see mm -hmm. you in a few minutes, Janet. I do it on text even. And yes, it is time consuming. But when you think about it, it's not that much time. And I promise you, the effect it has, you won't feel it in a minute. You won't feel it in a couple of hours. But over time, again, your brand is what you do. Your reputation is what people remember and share. And people will say that about you, that you care about them. And those little things make a difference. Yeah, they absolutely do. And, and especially, you know, some of the things like right now on Blab, as people come up and you have unusual usernames, I have to click your avatar. I have to go look at your bio to find out what your name is before I can mention you by name. And a lot of people don't put their names in their bios. Well, if I don't know who you are, why really am I going to connect with you? Because you're not being honest with us. You know, so that kind of honesty goes both ways. If you don't want me to know who you are, why are you even here? Well, that That's a great point. And, and there's two sides to that. I mean, sometimes... I enjoy when someone doesn't do that because I'll dig a little bit deeper and I'll find mm -hmm. their name. 
you know, like they have a, lo- a link to their blog and then in their blog, I got to go to their about me and then it's not in the about me. So I go to a blog post and they signed it. And I love replying back to those people like, hey, Janet, thanks for sharing, you know, my, my post. And one of two things happens. Either they go, oh, my God, he knew me or he remembered me or they say, wow, he really went to an effort to figure out who I was. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. Sometimes I look at that as an opportunity, but at the same time I'm saying, why are you making this so hard? You know, it's the same thing with contact info or I can't tell you how many people I know use LinkedIn. Talk about being mindful of what you're doing and say, you know, that LinkedIn just doesn't work for me. I never get outreach and I don't get any business from it. Well, guess what? I can't find your Twitter handle. I can't find your email address. I can't find your phone number. Why isn't it there? If you're looking for business, okay, if you're the CEO of General Mills, you don't have to have that information there. Or if you're whatever you are, if you're not looking for that outreach, but if you're saying to me, if you're in social sales and you're using the tool and all you're doing is pinging out you know, mass emails to people, but you're not making it easy for them to know who you are and contact you, then you drop, then it's you dropping the ball. Be mindful of how you make yourself available. That's, and that goes in a lot of directions. Being available is giving my contact information easily findable. Okay. Number two is it's making people feel good when they reach out to you. So that that's being, that's making yourself available, making people feel like they're not bothering you. Number Mm -hmm. three is actually finding time for them. Now, you don't have to make time for everybody, but you make time for a few people. That message spreads and people know that. And what I will, I'm going to give you guys a little tip here. Um, Nobody calls. Give out your phone number. Don't be afraid. Your phone's not going to ring off the hook. Okay. I give out my phone number on Twitter. I give out, it's on every platform I have. I give it out on stage. Of course, every time I'm on stage, somebody rings this thing after I give it out just because they want to be cute or whatever. And sometimes I answer it. Sometimes I don't. But the truth be told is they all tell everybody, you know, wow, this guy is so accessible. And that builds mm-hmm. your reputation. And I promise yeah. you, it won't get a That's I absolutely true. 516-270-5511. Operator standing by. I will tell you, I have called Ted and he answers the phone. And you're also really responsive across all the social media platforms. And I think that's that's something that, you know, is really remarkable because I know how many platforms you're on. And, you know, that kind of engagement really makes people feel good. And that one thing of just using your name when you respond to somebody and saying, you know, thank you, Janet. It gives you a little warm and fuzzy every time because it's personal and it's so easy for us to do that and to, you know, think about what that other person is thinking about to actually answer them by thinking about what they posted before we respond. You know, just retweeting all the time is kind of pointless and mindless. So, you know, I I don't think it's really doing us a lot of good. Well, look, there's so many ways to differentiate yourself and stand out and, and and just show people you care. And it can be something, like I said, it can be as little as an emoticon. I mean, you know, people make fun of me because they, they know that I use a lot of emoticons. And, and, you know, I answer, I retweet with it, I'll put them at the end of a sentence. But I use them to try to express a little bit, of, you know, emoticon stands for emotion. You know, that's the mm-hmm. emota part of it. And, you know, I'll write something that might be a little stern or a little bit, you know, pushy. And I'll put a smile at the end because that's my way of saying, you know, hey, this is all well and good. Like, I'm happy. I just want you to know that this needs to get done today. Or I might put a wink when I'm being a little bit sarcastic. Or I might put a frown when I'm actually I am a little pissed off. And I want to make sure you understand that without me having to use words that I might not want to use. But, you know, it's just a way, again, of being mindful of the message you're trying to get across, of what you're doing, of where you're going. Um, And then consistency is an important thing. You know, I I, I see a lot of people out there now, and and I've been the subject of it a couple of times, where they make fun of the fact that you use a hashtag all the time. And and there's a lot of negativity out there. Oh, you know, there's that hashtag again. And they start making fake hashtags to mimic the ones they're supposed to be. But what that's called is brand building and consistency. It's letting people know that this is what's important to you. To me, R&R, R-O-N-R, return on relationship, is my way of saying I, I am putting the relationship first. And then no let up is something that is a, is a life kind of thing for me. And it's also saying there's no let up in all this stuff we're doing. And if you're consistent with these things, then people know it's part of who you are. If you do them every once in a while, to me, then it just has less value. And that goes for whether it's being nice to people. And, you know, I love to wear my Be Good to People shirts. Um, mm-hmm. And Wittenberg, you know, developed that. And it's incredible. I met her, I don't know, 
probably six years ago now. And I'll tell you the difference, think about this, and I pay attention to this. When I get on a plane, when I travel, I almost exclusively wear my good, Be Good to People shirts. And I, if I'm wearing a sweater because it's cold, I take off the sweater while I'm boarding the plane. Or when I'm sitting down, I can't tell you the difference it makes in the way people treat me. And I've done both. I traveled without that shirt. Whether it's because I had to go straight to a meeting and I needed a collared shirt or a suit jacket or because it was still dirty and in the laundry because my dryer wasn't working or whatever it happened to be. And I can tell you right now that people see it and they treat me differently. Mm -hmm. And they smile and people stop me. I, I sit on the plane and people walk by me and they tap me and they point to me and they tell me they like it in flight attendants. It's a whole different ballgame. And then a lot of it goes to because they are now thinking, well, this person's probably going to be nice to me because why else would he wear a shirt like that unless he's going to mm -hmm. be nice? Therefore, they immediately, I mean, flight attendants have a whole different demeanor when, mm -hmm. when, when or, or people at the gate when I come on. I mean, and I've even gone so far as to kind of, use it where I'm trying to go through security and they're telling me my bag's too big. Now, meanwhile, it's the bag that, you know, comes with the dimensions and they, you know, if you try to, they, you ever try to fit your bag in that slot that they have <laughs> nothing. I mean, nothing I can't fit my bag slot. In that slot, right. <laughs> and that's, they want to use that just when they, they're having a bad day or something's going on and they'll tell me it's not fitting. And I'll look at them and go, Ooh. and they'll go, go ahead. <laughs> you know, it, and, it's those know, puppy dog eyes, Ted. Well, you know, I try. It's not where, the older I get, the less it works. I figure there's going to be a tipping point when I get to be that cute little old man where it might mm. really start. Working again. But, you know, we'll see. <laughs> right now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not there. I think Michael makes a good point that, you know, the first glance, the first time that we see people, in, we automatically make uh, judgments about who they are and what they represent. And so, you know, if we can put a good face on it, and smile, just smile. And that's true for your bio photos either. You know, I don't care if it's LinkedIn or not. For God's sake, smile. Show people who you are and use your eyes. It you makes smile. such a difference. Anybody see my tweet the other day with the, the, the girl on the beach that was just, I, I, I was thinking she was hangry. You guys know what hangry is, right? Mm -hmm. That means you're so hungry, you're angry. And I'm like, oh my God, she is hangry. And then of course I kept watching and I saw her go over to her boyfriend. I said, nope, she's just angry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it had to do with food, but I mean, you, we all see that. I mean, what's become pretty big in, in media, you've seen the standing bitch face or the, and again, mm -hmm. I, I'm using that just because it's what's out there in the media. I mean, guys do the same thing where you mm -hmm. just have that look in the face. And when I used to train sale, telephone salespeople, and I trained hundreds of them at one point, um, I would put a mirror on their desk in front of them. And I did this with customer service people at 800 Flowers when I was running corporate sales there. And I had, a, I had my, my, uh, my own designated co um, customer service team is I'd, put them, I'd make them sit at their desk with a mirror in front of them because it's amazing the way your facial expression changes the tone of your voice. You'd be right. really surprised. So what happens is you're thinking, and you, by the way, totally believing that you're being nice to people and people are saying, and I've had this happen. And part of it sometimes can be that New Yorker thing. Like when I first started working with Collective Bias, um, they were based in Bentonville, Arkansas. And I kept getting calls from John Andrews going, dude, you've got to be nice to the people here. You know, he goes, I don't, when you're here, they love you. But when you're in New York, I'm like, and I'm like, really, I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm being nice. But what I'm realizing is I'm being a New Yorker and being a New Yorker, not from necessarily a negative thing, but the fact that I'm going meeting to meeting, I'm coming out on the street, there's horns blaring, there's sirens going, I'm jumping on the subway or into a cab, you know, and this is before the, 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 the beauty of the Uber days, where at least you can get into a reasonably clean car. And mm. I'd be needing something before my next meeting and I'd be getting on the phone going, hey, listen, I really need you to get that proposal and my thing. And they'd be going, oh my God, he's so nasty. And I... You need to be, I needed to be made, no, I need to be made mindful of that, that number one is, and this is another important point, different cultures, different areas, different places, mm. you kindness in a different way. And I'll, I'll relate this back to the first time it really hit me, it was back in, let me see, I graduated, it was probably the early 80s, I went to visit my younger brother who was at, New Orleans, at, at Tulane in New Orleans, and I graduated from college and I was working and we're walking down the street and everybody's walking by going, hi, hi. And I'm like, I'm not saying hello to anybody because I'm from New York. I mean, you don't say hello to people you don't know on the street. God forbid they might shoot you. And my brother's going, Ted, you have to be nicer to people. I'm like, but I don't even know them. And the and what he said to me, because he or he was from New York living in New Orleans for a few years, he goes, 
it's different down here. And that's true of a lot of different places. You know, whether you're in the South or you're in the Midwest or you're in or just, it can be two towns over and they can, someone can say, Hey, but you know, this isn't as, as, as busy or a town or it's where a lot of people know each other. I mean, I'm in a town like Huntington, which is much more of a community town than where I came from. And a lot of people know each other. Therefore they tend to expect a different attitude. So you have to be mindful of where you are, who you're dealing with. And I have to be mindful at collective bias of the fact that I am on the phone with people who are in Bentonville in this really nice atmosphere in this beautiful town where they're Amazing. walking down to the town square for lunch, <laughs> where they go home from work every night. I, mean, I used to go to the office and at five 30, because I didn't have a car, they'd be going, okay, um, someone's got to take you back to your hotel or back to the apartment. I'm like, it's five 30. Where are you guys going? Well, we're going home. <laughs> I'm like, home at 5 30 who goes home at 5 30 i haven't had a job in my life where i left before 7 30 at night i mean seriously and you know this was just a different mindset now by the way most of them did work when they got home when they get back online later but this is a midwestern town with a little bit of a southern accent with a you know what a mindset where you go home at 5 30 you you, mm -hmm. you have to with your kids you know you don't do that in new york city because that means leaving work at 3 30 to get home with all the commuting and people just skip on that but you know or, or it also is a different mindset of a different time where things now and a lot of companies are getting a lot of people working remote there's different ability to do things and now also we have the tools to do these things and you have to be mindful of who you're working with who you're dealing with what's important to them i'm mm -hmm. speaking in ireland next week and you know i'm giving my return of relationship presentation i'm not giving a new presentation and they don't want I mean, they want, they have never heard this. They, they're, they're four, they're two years behind the UK and the UK is two years behind us. But I have to be mindful of the fact that the audience I'm speaking to, whether it means mm. speaking a little slower. Now, in Ireland, that's not really a problem, but I spoke in Sweden and, or I spoke down in, 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 um, in Colombia and somebody's, you know, inter not interpreting, interpreting is when you're writing, it's what is it called when you're speaking, um, um, Damn, the words jumping out of my head. But instead of interpreting, but they're they're reading into people with headphones, and I've got to. And I had someone in the back going, hmm. <laughs> "Yeah, yeah I bet you drove the interpreters crazy." <laughs> and that's being mindful mm -hmm. of the people that whoever it is you're dealing with. It's being mindful of the person behind the counter at the Starbucks. It's being mindful of the person that comes in to work on your house. They come from different walks of life. They come from different worlds. Different things are important to them. And, you know, we all do this naturally. We don't necessarily think of it as mindfulness, but most of us don't do it nearly enough. Just put, mm -hmm. it's, it's simple as putting yourself in the other person's shoes or like we talked about earlier, allowing that person to be, they see things from your perspective and live in your shoes. Mm, yeah. Well, and you do that more face to face or on video or Skype or whatever it is that you're communicating with somebody, you know, it's a lot easier to kind of assimilate what their mindset is. It's like, you know, when you travel from, you know, California to Georgia, all of a sudden you start finding that you picked up a little accent and finally you're kind of slowing down. And it's one of those things that you do naturally because you're starting to be immersed in the in the environment and absorbing that, at least to some extent. But when we're talking to people in text messaging or on Twitter or any place where it's text, you know, I see people that are always typing in all caps. Well, do they know what they're doing? You know, probably well, and, not. And a lot of times they don't. And by the way, it, it's, it again, there's ways to tell them and there's ways to not. Mm -hmm. You know, a way to tell them is usually what I do is when I see someone post something, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or somewhere else, if I really disagree with it and to the point where I think they shouldn't have posted it, mainly because they're a friend or, you know, I don't tell them in the feed. I, I write a side message, you know, like, you know, you mm -hmm. might want to back off a little bit on that or you might want to lighten up a little bit. And then I put a smile next to it and, and I write and then I, I take a few more minutes to write. I'm just trying to help. Like, I am not being critical. I'm just I'm seeing something that maybe you're not seeing. We all get into things. We all get too deep in where we can't see it. It's why when I went through the four year battle to keep my kids in my life and this whole thing, I, the whole time I had four friends that people that knew about this or I, and I talk about it sometimes is that I blind copied them on every single email. And I was very lucky. I had amazing people in my life that were able to be there for me. And the reason I did that was, first of all, they would hold me back when I needed it. And they also put it all in context for them. So if I came out of court or if I came out of something, I wouldn't have to explain, take an hour to explain it. They kind of saw the email, they reviewed them. And then they would come back to me and say, you know, you might want to back off on that. And it allowed mm -hmm. them 
to help me see it outside myself, which is very hard for most of us to do most of the time. And we need people that do that for us. And I'm very lucky. Like I said, I have a few friends that will, will tell me like, you know, or usually what they'll do is if, if it's really bad, which fortunately I, I haven't had too much of that lately, um, they'll smack me right down and there's somebody I trusted from. But more often than not, they'll talk to me about it. And sometimes I turn them around. They go, oh, I see your point. No, mm-hmm. keep doing it. it. It makes sense. But I think we all need to allow people in our lives that can help us be mindful in one way or another. Oh, absolutely. I have some very close friends that, you know, I'm going through some issues myself right now and, and really being able to, just reach out to them and say, okay, this is what's going on with me. And should I be dealing with it this way or just be a sounding board for me so I can work this out before I respond to it? You know, and and I think that's something we all need to do. If, you know, you've got something burning that you've just got to talk about, write it down and read it aloud before you send it. I I want to tell you something. I do not click that send button, even on a tweet. I Mm. look at my tweet before, I mean, I write it, I look at it, even just for a normal just response, no matter what it is. Every time I take that extra second to step back and then click send to think mm-hmm. about what I'm saying. And then if it's something more important, very often, I mean, I get an email. It can be from my ex. It can be from my daughters. I will write the response just like you said, and then I will step away from it. Sometimes I don't send it for days or hours. And I let it sit, and I, very often I moderate it. I change it. I work on it. You know, it, it, And I think that a lot of us – it's that two second gap before you respond. Just the breath, you know, that can make just a breath that, that can really make all the difference. And now here's another side. We also have to be mindful of very often we over respond to think something we see someone doing that we don't approve of when we don't know the whole story. Hmm. And there, there's two things I do about that. First of all, I stay out of a lot of it. I really do. If I, if I, I know, especially again, if it's my one of my closest friends, if I know their whole story, if I know where they're coming from, I might jump into the conversation either publicly or, or with them on the side. Most often, because how close, how we're not that very close to everybody, or you haven't followed a story long, it's as simple as if you see a Facebook post and you read a comment 30 down. And there's something in there you either take issue with or you want to look at the rest of the feed. I can't believe how often Mm. people, they have the opportunity to read the whole thing and make a valuable comment, add some valuable input, and they say something that makes no sense at all because they didn't bother reading what's going on in the conversation. It's Mm -hmm. all there for you. It's like going to a meeting without looking at somebody's LinkedIn profile or Googling them or finding out something and saying something stupid like, how long have you been here at Edelman? Oh, my God. Like if, when I go in a meeting, and I go in a meeting like all the time with, with vendors who I consult for, and they're trying to sell a major brand, and the salesman goes in there, and he's totally unprepared, not with his product. He's got that already, but he makes an idiot out of himself personally because he didn't do the simple stuff of just it checking out who this was. Or he says something like to the person, you know, yeah, American Express sucks. Dude, she was the EVP at American Express for 10 years, their entire <laughs> Their, their entire social strategy is based on what she did. You could have found that out in three seconds of the mindfulness of knowing that in, that information is available. You know, mm-hmm. there's so much out there. There's so many tools that are available. Recently, you know, I started using uh, more actively Nimble. Uh, I probably don't use it enough. I'm really bad at figuring out software. I suck at it. But finally, you know, John Ferreira has been reaching out to me for four years. He's an amazing guy. He has private mm-hmm. phone calls with me. But I never quite got it until Brian Kramer kept saying, dude, you got to be using this. And then last time I was there, Brian, being mindful of who I am, said, I know you're never going to do this until I sit down with you and walk you through it. <laughs> Yes, Brian, that is true. By the way, he also cleaned out my computer, put this amazing app on it that constantly, he, oh boy, he, Brian's awesome. Did he, but he, did he hook that. you up with Evernote too while he was at it? No, that's his... I, you know, because I'm not ready to make that move. You know, I have read his mm. post, which is awesome. You know, but some things are, are good for us. Some things are, I, I might not be willing yet to make those changes, but Nimble was something as simple as, again, I am just really bad with, I, I, it doesn't, I'm not intuitive with apps and software. I'm just not. Mm-hmm. Can I feel I tell my daughter, it's all about mindset. Don't tell me you can't do. Tell me you don't want to do. So my answer is I don't want to figure out the technology (laughs) because it takes me so much longer. It doesn't come natural to me, and I don't have time for it. So I've got awesome Mm. people in my life, like Brian Fanzer, who taught me how to use Snapchat and and Periscope. And believe me, when we're in Dublin next week, he's going to have a whole other set of list of things. He's, I mean, I I reach out to him. When I just want to know how to do something because it can take me five hours to figure it out on an app and somebody else can tell me how to do it in two minutes. And Brian sat me down and he walked me through it. Of course, I'm probably using this much of Nimble right now until I see Brian Kramer again and he shows me 
a little bit more of how to do because it's just slow for me to pick up. But Brian was mindful of my, of my shortcomings in that respect. And he looked at me and said, don't worry, this is going to be easy because he also knows that I'm going to say, if it's too hard, I don't want to do it. I don't have time. You know, if it's going to take me 20 uses to figure out, you know, he also showed me how to use Spotify. You think Spotify, how hard is that? Okay. <laughs> but he walked, I was complaining about the, the, the drain that, that, um, that what's the other one with the P, um, 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 which I'm not Pandora. even using. Pandora puts on your phone. Mm. Said, Dude, why are you using Spotify? And you can and you can download all the all the music onto your phone, and you can take it offline. I'm like, show me how. And he did, and now I'm mm -hmm. doing it. Of course, I have to call him up every once in a while. I go, how did you do that? No, but so, <laughs> but but that's also, and then and then I have to be mindful of his time. His job is mm -hmm. not to teach me how to use everything. I mean, I've gone through that with a lot of guys. I have problems with my WordPress or other things. And, you know, someone will say, call me anytime when you need me. And let's be aware of this with people. Reach out to me anytime. That doesn't mean I'm available for you whenever you need me. For okay? the rest of your life as your personal support person. Well, in any way, shape, or form, I tell people, reach out mm -hmm. to me anytime. That doesn't mean I will be available when you reach out. It means you might have to work mm -hmm. around my schedule. You have to be mindful of the fact that I, I've had people reach out and go, oh, you, you said I could reach out to you and tell them, how come you can't talk to me now? Well, because I can't talk to you now. Why are you telling me it's going to take a week? Because look, this is a busy week. And mm -hmm. then, then some, some of it, by the way, is very mindfully intentional. I get a lot of outreach from people I've never heard from. I barely know they follow me. And, or even I do, but I know that something came to their head in the moment and it's, they're not going to follow up. And my classic thing is, Ping me next Monday and we'll find a time. And I would tell mm. you that eight out of 10 times, I never hear back from that person. Because, and I, and this is my favorite, by the way. We've all been through this. Janet, I need you. I need you now. It's so important. I have this critical thing to talk to you. And by the way, you answer within three seconds of that tweet and then you never hear back from them. <laughs> yeah, right? that's one of my favorites. <laughs> you know, you desperately, and again, I'll, I'll play with this, people. Say yes to everybody because most of them will never be there when you get back to them. I mean, I get this mm. with emails. Take it, I have a moment of your time. You think they took the time to find my email address. They send me an email. And then I never get back to them. Six months later, I get an email. Oh, you know what? I tried to reach out to you a few months ago, and I'd love to do it again. And you're like, great. Call me back. Like next week. <laughs> like next <year. laughs> I think that's also, besides, you know, it's just them being – it's them not being mindful of, of your, your time. time, but it's also not being mindful of their own self because, you know, they need to be prepared for this. You know, when, when you call Ted and you want something from him, you need to know what you want, how soon you want it, what it is that you really expect and think you're going to get, you know, it's be ready when you reach out to somebody just to be I respectful. I ju my new reply to a lot of the general emails I get, when I know they're real, they weren't sent out by a bot or they weren't sent out in a mass, I can see there's a little personalization more than just dear Ted. You know, there's something about return relationship or something. You know, most often it's, it's, it's just a very general, I really need to speak to you. And my class is I write back and go, great, I would love to find some time, but I'd like to know what is it you want to talk about? What are you looking to accomplish? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and by the way, it's okay if you write back and go, just want to hear your voice that's okay because that puts it in perspective for me where I might just find a moment to call you. But if you say to me, you know, I've got this issue, it's expiring Friday, you know, Janet Fouts told me to reach out to you. Now you've just put it in perspective. And by the way, I can't tell you how often that happens. Somebody reached out to me and they're out of nowhere. And then when I write back to them, I find out that they were sent to me by somebody who I really respect and care about, but they just didn't even bother to mention that, you know, and that's well, a whole different thing. And do that. Say, this is what I need. This is what I want to talk about. This person recommended me, but don't write a book and don't send us your whole business plan because it's really a little too much information. Unless it's for, a really, you know. really awesome. <laughs> there you go. Everybody's business plan is really, really, really awesome, right? <laughs> well, yes, to them at least. Yeah. I meant to me. <laughs> So, you know, but like, look, that doesn't, by the way, remember something. Fred Wilson, who is who I was talking about earlier, turned down mm -hmm. Airbnb and he writes because he couldn't get past the air mattress part of it. You know, it's a, <laughs> and by the way, that's when they were raising $600,000 at a 2 million valuation. It's a 20, and that was in 2008. It's a two mm -hmm. twenty five billion valuation now. And by the way, here's another point about being mindful. It 
takes time. You know, I know Gary Vaynerchuk says this a lot. Everyone thinks you're an overnight success. And I get people all the mm-hmm. time that say to me, you know, I try to use this hashtag. It didn't work. You know, how did you get traction for return relationship? Well, for people to know you by that. Well, I started using hashtag R&R in 2009, January. Mm-hmm. 2009. I started using No Let Up over a year and a half ago. I started using Ted Saki two years ago. I mean, to, to the point where it, it, it means something to somebody. You you have to be mindful of the fact these things take time. You know, Airbnb, and this might sound like to, to old time businessmen, wow, started in 2007, it's 2016, look at this. But man, they came under so many situations where they could have just shut that damn thing down. I mean, their first three mm. iterations did not work at all. They launched, I don't, most people don't know this, they Launched in 2007, then they launched again in 2008 at South by Southwest. Do you know how many people used the service in South by Southwest in 2008? Three. Three people. Wow. Then they launched again in 2008 at the, at the I think it was a Democratic, which one was in Denver? One of the Democratic National Convention. It was the DNC, yeah. One of them, and all of a sudden they got some traction. I mean, and then as recently as what, 2013 or 2014, they started getting sued by every city in the country. I mean, mm. you know, and, and there are a lot of times where any of us could, you could lay down. None of these things are overnight successes. Uber is not an overnight, overnight success. The biggest of them could have shut down 10, 20, 30 times. And again, this is not saying you have, I'm not saying that you have to be that tenacious. There are times to shut down a business. There are times to say, I'm done. This isn't working. And that's a really mm-hmm. important. I think uh, who says that the most on Shark Tank? Um, Jay-Z says that a lot where you know, guys, if I were you, I would pack up, close up this business and take your tremendous talents and use it somewhere else. But you also have to remember and be mindful of the fact that nothing happens overnight. And if you hear about the stories that do, that's great. But they're the real, real anomalies. And, I mean, as are multi-billion dollar companies. You know, we hear about sure. the news, but there's thousands and thousands and thousands of companies getting started for those minute one tenth of one tenth of one tenth of percent that make those kind of dollars most of but there are a lot of that make people a living that we don't hear about as well Mm -hmm. and that's success you don't have to have a multi-million dollar or multi-billion dollar business to be successful you can be feeding your family that's success Mm -hmm. we all set our own our own level for success Right. Or just yeah. a smile on your face. That's damn success every day. There Wake up are. every day with a smile. You are the most successful person I know. Mm. That's really true. I, I like that a lot. Well, I want to be respectful of your time and, and thank you so much, Ted. You know, it's always great to talk to you, whether it's here or face to face. And uh, I hope that everybody's following you on Twitter um and we've already got it a lot of fun come check out here's my thing about snapchat and and i don't care if you follow me or who you follow but if you're if you're experiencing and working with social platforms if the social world is important to you and i'm not saying it has to be it doesn't have to be important as you know important to everybody if it is you must experience snapchat that doesn't mean you have to give it all your time that doesn't mean you have to do it all the time but you need to understand it because For me, it's the purest of social platforms right now. If you're not engaging, communicating, or storytelling, you might as well not be there. You, you, you won't hit people's feeds. It won't sit there like Facebook. There's no algorithms throwing up your shit on somebody. If you're not adding value, people are not going to be there for you. And you need to understand that because every other platform, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, we can all fool ourselves into thinking we're getting the most out of those platforms by broadcasting or advertising. And I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying broadcasting on social channels doesn't give you some value, but you're not leveraging it for all it's worth and you can convince yourself the rest of it's not necessary. On Snapchat, you can't. If you're not Mm -hmm. being social, if you're not storytelling, engaging, communicating, and and again, watch your kids for God's sake because they are communicating and don't ever say, oh my God, our kids are so, you know, they they don't talk to anybody and they don't have skills. They have so much more social skills than you ever had. They're communicating at scale with hundreds of other people at a time. They are snapping them. They're talking to them. They're sharing videos. They have text lists that have, what, 20, 30 people on them and they're all getting together and knowing each other is and they're communicating engaging and socializing much more than we ever were capable of learn from them stop telling them to put the devices away because they won't just like we did mm-hmm. i don't know about you i'm 58 years old i used to go to bed at night with the phone under my under my blanket you know and i was i used to muffle because when you dialed you know it, you remember the old dials click and i would i would muff i figured out a way to muffle that with a pillow and then i go under my blanket so i could talk to my buddy after bedtime 
I mean, they're going to do that. So instead, start learning, especially if you're a marketer, start learning. I mean, if you're not, if you're, look, we're all, if you're a parent, then you're a marketer because you're trying to market yourself to your kids. You're trying to engage, interact, communicate. Hopefully, if you're a good parent, you're trying to be a part of your kids' lives. So if you're going to be a part of their, their lives, try to understand some of the things they're doing. Maybe it's that crazy rock and roll the kids listen to, you know? <laughs> Elvis. Who's that guy, Jerry Garcia? <laughs> um, whatever it is, try to understand it, and you'll understand them better. Mm. Mm. That's a good good thing to end on. Yes. Thank you very much, Ted. I really appreciate it.